What's up everybody, welcome to Heresy Financial. My name is Joe Brown and today we are looking at why passive investing has turned the markets into the biggest bubble of all time. So we're gonna look at a couple of things. Number one, we're actually gonna to have to define what passive investing is. Take a look at what it really is because there are some misunderstandings between the common understanding of what passive investing is and what it really is when you look underneath the surface. The second thing that we're gonna look at is what the impact is that passive investing has on markets overall. All. And then number three, what is the end game here? How does this play out in the end? Because what's going on right now is not sustainable. So once this kind of facade starts to reverse on itself, what happens? Ready? Let's dive in. All right, guys, so there is this principle in physics called the observer effect. And basically, just in its most simplest form, it basically states that in order to observe something, you have to exert some sort of influence on it. You can't really observe something without influencing it in any way whatsoever. Now, one of the common examples of this is something like observing your uh, tire pressure, right? In order to look and see what your tire pressure is, you actually have to test the pressure, which releases some air that has an influence on what the tire pressure actually is, right? It's negligible, but it's still some influence. Taken down to like the particle level, if you're trying to observe an electron, the only way to do that will be to introduce some, some form of electromagnetic, uh, wave or electromagnetic energy, like hit it with a photon or uh, some sort of x-ray or something like that. And obviously that's going to influence what the electron does. And so in order to observe something, even at the particle level, this holds true. This same principle applies in investing. Now let's take a step back and look at what is investing? What is a market? Basically a market is just buyers and sellers coming together to determine what the price of something will be for, you know, the people who want to buy and sell it, right? So eBay is a market, Craigslist is a market, OfferUp is a market, the NASDAQ is a market. All these things are places where buyers and sellers come together to, you know, come to an agreement on a price that one party wants to sell to another at, one party wants to buy from another at. Now, this is precisely why there's no such thing as actual passive investing because all passive investing is actually an action. It's buying. So what is meant by passive investing? Really what's meant by passive investing when people are, you know, using it for, you know, in its common term is basically don't try and time the market. The efficient market hypothesis is largely true. You're not going to be able, most people aren't going to be able to outperform active managers. So don't even try, just put your money in the overall stock market and it'll grow over time. Now there are a couple of critical critical assumptions here. Number one is that the current price is the best price. Said another way, if you have money to invest, give me money and I will buy. No regard of what the price is or what the fundamentals are of the underlying investments. If you have money to invest, invest at the current price. The current price is always the best price. It's always the right price. And conversely, if you need money, sell at this price, at any price, whatever the current price is. It says basically at its simplest form, passive investing says the current price is the best price. Now this is why there's really no such thing as passive investing because it's really an algorithmic trade. There are lots of algorithms out there that trade based off of various features of the market, whether you know it's fundamentals or technicals, whether it's chart patterns or timing, whatever. There are lots of algorithms out there that many computers try and trade to make money. Passive investing is simply the simplest algorithm algorithm out there. If you want to invest, buy at the current price. If you, so you put in money, it buys. You need money out, it sells. That's it. Now, Jack Bogle of Vanguard, he was the one that pretty much popularized it and got passive investing to the mainstream. And one of the ways that he did this was by looking back at like 100 years of history. And he basically said, hey, if you had just invested in the indexes, the major stock market averages for these last few decades, you would have outperformed most money managers. Now, technically, that was true. Here's the problem. There was no vehicle or mechanism for actual passive investing until very recently. If you were living in, you know, 1920, 1930, 1940, there was no vehicle for you to just go buy the S&P 500. So it's a misnomer. It's uh, it's actually disingenuous to suggest that we should be using that as a metric because that wasn't possible back then. The first mutual fund was uh, technically established in 1924. It was an active fund though. It wasn't until 1975 that the first index fund was actually established. Now you could argue that somebody could have have gone and bought 
all of the companies in, you know, a, a given index like the Dow, you know, buy, buy stock into 30 companies. But then an individual investor, especially an average investor, would never have had the means to research and uh, calculate and know at any given time how many shares he would need to buy or sell of each company to make sure that his weighting was correct given the index let alone the fact that the fees associated with that type of trading were prohibitive for anybody to be able to engage in that sort of trading behavior unless they had, you know, millions of dollars. And even then it just wasn't something that was practical. Now, this is where we get into some of the problems with passive investing, because you're looking back at a time period in history where passive investing wasn't possible. So yes, when you look at an overall market of everybody buying and selling something and you look at the prices and look at the performance of all the aggregate of everybody engaging in behavior in that market, well, of course you're going to find that most people didn't outperform the average because all investors put together equal the average. And so using that as justification for passive investing, when passive investing wasn't actually available as an option before, means that once passive investing starts, it will actually have an impact on markets. And that if passive investing was available before, those same results would not have held true because they would have impacted markets in a way that was different than what markets actually had during that time. And so with the introduction of passive investing and as it gains more popularity, you actually have a self-reinforcing cycle because the people running passive funds, they say, hey, passive is better and we have the proof. Look, you can look and you can see that, you know, our passive fund has done better than the majority for the time that it's been around. And since the performance is better with better fees, you attract more more capital. But what happens in a market when you attract more capital to something? You're actually buying something, you're making purchases, and it's a market. It's not an entity that is immune to uh, influence by buying and selling. It is itself buying and selling. And so when you have money going into passive, you have money going in to make purchases of very specific companies, the companies that are a part of those indexes. So you start off with a claim that passive is better and then you get more money to go into passive which causes more buying in those underlying companies that are a part of the passive indexing strategy which bids up the prices it causes buying pressure of all of those companies which since that buying pressure happens it bids up the prices that means the performance of those companies outperforms which means that passive actually does better which means that since it does better it attracts more capital and you restart the cycle now jack bogle pretty much the founder of index investing recently said, hey, there's actually a problem with this because passive investing, passive investing as defined, really only works if it's a very small percentage of the market. Yes, it's going to have some influence on the overall price action of the stock market. But overall, as long as it's a small enough percentage, then that's what makes it work. The problem comes in when it passes up the amount of all the other money in the market when it becomes more than 50% of the market, when it becomes the majority. And here's the reason. Once the majority of money in a market is passive, it ceases to actually be a market. Because you have to remember, what is a market? It's buyers and sellers coming together to determine how much to pay or sell for something. And only the active investors are the ones doing that. In a market, you have the people who want to sell. They're saying, hey, I'm willing to sell at this price or any price above that. And the higher the price gets, the more I'm obviously willing to sell of that. And conversely, if I'm wanting to buy something, I'm willing to buy something at a maximum price and I'm willing to buy it anywhere beneath that. The lower something gets, the more I'm willing to buy of it because the more on sale it is, the more value there is I'm getting for my money. The problem is only the active investors are doing that. Passive pays no attention to the value. Passive pays no attention to the underlying, pays no attention to the price or, or anything other than is there cash to invest, therefore buy. This means that the less money there is in active investing, the more volatility you have. Because the only time passive will make a purchase is when somebody throws money at it. And a big majority of passive investing is done through retirement accounts where the money going in to make those purchases just happens automatically on a regular basis from paychecks. So this means that the only liquidity provided to a market is by the active investors who are saying, hey, if it comes down to a certain price, I'll buy, or if it goes up to a certain price, I'll sell. Well, this is one of the reasons why we've seen such an increase in these massively volatile flash crashes over the past years. 
When passive becomes a majority of the market, it virtually takes control. And when you plot this out mathematically, you see that essentially uh, when it when it tips past that 50% mark on, on, uh, on buying pressure, it will drive prices of what's being bought to an infinite level. There is no cap. And then when the trend reverses, if the trend is selling instead of buying, which, which is very easy to happen, we've seen this happen many times, the model projects that it goes to zero. Not, not that it drops 90%, not that it drops 80%, that it goes to zero. Now we've seen isolated occurrences of this happen throughout the market recently. And the problem with these isolated incidences starts when somebody says, give me money, when the, when the trend reverses and people start to say, give me money rather than the opposite, which is just, here's cash. Now you think maybe, well, how do we know this would ever happen with the stock market? Because you know money has always grown and money is always going into the stock market. But the problem is where is the most of the money that's invested in stocks right now? It's in retirement accounts, it's in pensions, and the majority of this, the vast majority of this is held by people who are older. And as more and more of this money starts being you know, re withdrawn to pay for living expenses, shifted into bond portfolios for a more conservative portfolio allocation, there's not gonna be near as much money going in and the trend will reverse from money inflows into passive investing to money outflows from passive investing. So what is the end game? The likely end game scenario here is that we see a brutal melt up followed by a brutal vicious crash. Like I mentioned before, we've seen isolated examples of this and I'll give you one here. Back in the beginning of 2018, we saw this unfold in the volatility markets specifically the short volatility markets. The market for these instruments, whether it was options or futures or ETFs that uh, were comprised of these baskets of derivatives that were essentially shorting volatility was much larger than the underlying actually was. And so what you saw was there was a lot of money flowing into short volatility strategies. Now a short volatility strategy is basically in essence, just a bet that the market will be less volatile, that there will be less uh, big movements, uh, you know, at, whether whether it's in the short term future, long term future, it's a bet against volatility. And so a short volatility ETF is one that if if uh, if there's no, if there's less volatility in the market, the short volatility ETF will go up. If there's more volatility in the market, the short volatility ETF will go down. There was so much money flowing into these short volatility instruments that we actually had a rise in the value of short volatility strategies just from the money going in, while at the same time, real volatility was actually increasing. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you, it would be the same thing as if there's a lot of money going into SPY, the S&P 500 ETF, and so it's making that ETF go up at the same time as every company inside the S&P 500 is actually going down. Same type of thing happened in 2018 with volatility. All you need to do is take a look at some of these charts of SVXY or XIV or any of these short volatility instruments that were in play at that time. You see that pretty much overnight, they went to zero. Some of them dropped 80%, some of them dropped 90%, some of them dropped literally to zero. They just dissolved. There was nothing left. It was great while money was going in during a period of low volatility that was actually spawned by just money going in to short volatility. You had a massive rise and a massive increase in wealth in these short volatility strategies. And then as soon as the trend reversed, these plays go to zero. Now, we also saw this in uh, the beginning of this year when the market started to crash beginning of 2020 at, at the end of February through March, we saw the biggest and the fastest, the swiftest drop uh, in markets that we've ever seen. And so these dynamics are not just isolated and uh, unique to these uh, exotic strategies like shorting volatility. These are properties of systems that uh, are supposed to be dynamic and governed actively that have a uh, an influence that changes how money is flowing in and out, causing structural fragility. Now we haven't quite yet hit this 50% tipping point. We're close, but we haven't quite yet hit where a majority of the money invested in the stock market is coming from passive. The trend is going that way, but we haven't quite reached it yet. Now, once we do hit that point, or if we do hit that point, the models would suggest that the most likely outcome in a system like this, where you switch to being controlled and governed by passive strategies is that we have just an 
unreal, unbelievable, unstoppable melt up. And then at some point, the trend reverses itself and there's an utter collapse, especially in the funds themselves that have that are absorbing a lot of the money coming in, where you go, you know, down 80%, 90% in a lot of cases, potentially even going to zero. Now, a few things to note, just because you don't use index funds doesn't mean that uh, you're not at risk here. Because keep in mind, this is governing the entire stock market here. This is impacting the money flowing in and out of, of actual equities. Number two, the money made in this melt up will be historic. Number three, the money lost in the epic crash will be historic. And finally, the values of companies that are just, you know, left on the sidewalks in the carnage after the destruction happens will be historic. Any companies that survive will be able to be picked up for pennies on the dollar. Now, is there anything that could cause this uh, whole thing to be avoided? Absolutely. This end game scenario that I've painted for you is by no means inevitable. And the largest factor contributing to uh, this kind of end game scenario not playing out is the Federal Reserve purchasing equities. Now, is it legal for the Fed to buy stocks? No. Have things being illegal stopped the Fed from doing them in the past? No, this is the, there's precedent for this through the setting up of special purpose vehicles held by the treasury that the Federal Reserve is funding the purchases of like high yield bonds. The Federal Reserve is not supposed to be able to buy high yield bonds. They do so through these special purpose vehicles held at the treasury, which by the way, the last time special purpose vehicles were, you know, in the news as much as they have been this year, it was uh, during the collapse of Enron through all of their accounting fraud they created special purpose vehicles for. Second, there's precedent for uh, a central bank purchasing equities with Japan right now. They've been purchasing equities for years. And so if we do have some sort of another flash crash from this trend reversing itself, I would not uh, be surprised at all if the Federal Reserve steps in to backstop the entire equity market and just says, since there's no active buyers and passive buyers are now passive sellers, we're just going to be the buyers of last resort and just purchase anything again, regardless of values or regardless of fundamentals. Now, how to protect yourself? Well, I know I say it a lot, but options can be really helpful in a situation like this because you can, with a, you know, a very small allocation of capital, you can bet on a melt up and you can bet on an epic crash with options that are so far out of the money that uh, they're considered to be basically worthless. Tail hedges are cheap because, you know, 99.9% .9 of them expire worthless. But in tail events, they're everything. Now, my options course, if you don't know how to use options or if you're kind of a beginner with options and you want to upgrade your skills, I've got two options courses, foundations and advanced. I've got them on sale for uh, for Christmas through the end of the year. Uh, you can also gift these courses to people. And so I've got them on sale. Promo code gift 2020, 25% off through the end of the year. So if you haven't picked it up yet, now is a great time to do so on sale. The other thing to note is that usually in these cases, it's not possible to just wait until some sort of a crash starts to happen in order to short because if you want to short something you have to wait for an uptick and a lot of times these things uh, go no bid and so that just means hey there's literally nobody saying that they want to come in and buy these things at any price so the price can fall virtually again to zero in the case of something like svxy or xiv like i mentioned before these were the short volatility instruments they went to zero basically overnight it wasn't uh, you know a three day four day five day thing they just became worthless and finally, these things can never be timed. This might be something that could, this could definitely be something that happens within the next couple of months, might not happen for a couple of years, might not ever happen, especially given the uh, uncertainty effect of somebody with an unlimited printer coming in and becoming the buyer of last resort. If that happens, especially before a melt up or a crash, uh, we could just see that uh, in dollar terms, a crash never actually happens. You'd only be able to see the crash if you're measuring stocks with something other than dollars because the dollar is losing value so much faster than the equities are. We've seen this kind of thing happen throughout history as well, uh, most notably John Law's Mississippi bubble in the 1700s. John Law essentially controlled the central bank he backed up his currency with land in uh, in the U.S. through his Mississippi company, and in order to keep the uh, Mississippi company shares inflated because the value of the currency relied on there being value in what was backing up the currency, he just kept on printing currency to buy up those shares. Well, ultimately, you can't have two things that are uh, really worthless trying to support each other, so that caused hyperinflation and ended with him having to flee the country. Massive bubble, massive collapse. But you would have never known there was a collapse 
unless you are measuring it in things other than the lever of their money at the time that he was hyperinflating. You can definitely see the bubble and the collapse happen if you are measuring it with gold or silver. So time will tell, stay hedged, keep some wealth out of the system and be ready for anything because in this day and age, we know anything can happen. As always, really appreciate you guys. Have a great day.